Um, but the interesting thing is, even last year when we weren't able to, to be together, the sun still rose on that day, and uh, Jesus is still alive, and so we can continue to face the challenges that the world throws at us um, because of that knowledge and the hope that we have in Him. And so we're really glad that you're here with us on this beautiful Easter morning. You know, C.S. Lewis made a, made a statement uh, when he was uh, dealing with the grief of the loss of his wife. Um, he referred to this world as the Shadowlands. He said, uh, we live in the Shadowlands. You know, um, the shadow of doubt seems to loom large over us. And I, I don't need to, to give many examples because uh, I'm sure most of you here uh, are old enough to, to recognize this. Uh, we've seen it lived out this last year, and maybe even this morning you felt it. Like even in something as little as, you know, do I wear my mask or do I shake a hand? Do I, you know, do I do the elbow bump or the handshake? And there's just that sense of, of doubt and, and, and wonder, and you're never quite sure uh, what this world holds. Uh, you know, it's interesting then when you mix that with politics, which we're not going to get into politics, but when you mix it with politics, it's even harder, isn't it? And, and so we go through life constantly living in this shadow, uh, a shadow of doubt. For some of us here today, um, we are living in a shadow of doubt even now. Uh, some of you are facing challenges that uh, maybe defy any of the circumstances I've already mentioned. It could be a loved one who's battling an illness. It could be the loss of a job. It could be a broken relationship. It could be financial trouble. I know for many of us that are here today, um, we've had an experience where a very, very dear friend was in a tragic accident and he is um, on life support and it looks like today on Easter Sunday um, that that battle will come to an end. And so we live in the shadow. We live in the shadow of doubt, a shadow of fear. And you know, the very first disciples lived in that shadow. They lived in that shadow before Jesus uh, they knew Jesus, they lived in that shadow as Jesus was walking with them, and they certainly lived in that shadow when Jesus was arrested, and then the shadow was at its darkest when they heard that he had been crucified. The shadow of doubt. We live in that shadow. Luke, one of the gospel writers, was writing a letter to uh, a new believer, somebody who had never seen Jesus. They didn't have the benefit of knowing him when he was alive. They didn't have the benefit of seeing him resurrected. And because of that, we're a lot like Luke's friend. You know, we, we live 2,000 years after the fact, and, and, and we can't see with our eyes the things that those disciples saw on that first Easter morning. But this is what Luke said as he's writing this letter to his friend. He said, since I have investigated all the reports in close detail, starting from the story's beginning, I decided to write it all out for you, most honorable Theophilus, so you can know beyond the shadow of a doubt the reliability of what you were taught. And then Luke goes on and he writes this story. He starts with the birth of Jesus and he goes all the way up and he tells the story of his death and then he tells the story of the resurrection. And Luke wants Theophilus to know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you can believe this is true. It happened, there are eyewitnesses. And so I think it's important for us to remember, some of you here may be affiliated with the law profession and know this better than I do, but you know, in our own world, in our own country, we've got a legal system that seeks to prove things. You know, if, if somebody's gonna be arrested and convicted, they're gonna be brought to trial and hopefully they get a, a more fair trial than Jesus got. They're going to be brought to a place where they're gonna be asked, uh, the jury is gonna be asked to, to weigh the evidence. And they're asked in that kind of case, they, they're, the, the jury is told all the time that they have to be able to convict this person beyond a reasonable doubt. That's the, if you're a Matlock fan or you watch any legal dramas, you've heard that, beyond all reasonable doubt. That's exactly, exactly what Luke is trying to do is he's writing this story, he's writing this testimony. And so in Luke chapter 23, he tells the story of the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And, and it goes like this. Let me read this for you this morning. Luke 23, beginning in verse 44. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out in a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion... Saul, what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. 
and all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle when they saw what had taken place returned home beating their breasts and all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. Now there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council, a good righteous man who had not consented to their decision and actions. And he was looking for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down and he wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid him in a tomb cut in stone where no one had ever yet been laid. It was the day of preparation for the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb where his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed by this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, and they were frightened and bowed down their faces to the ground. The men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while you were still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise? And they remembered his words. And they returned from the tomb. They, they, and when they returned from the tomb, they told these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told them these things to the told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them as an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stopping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves. He went home marveling at what had happened. Now, I want you to think about this for a second, and especially if you're somebody who's heard this story maybe repeated over your lifetime. You don't even know how many times you've heard it. We become kind of inoculated to it, don't we? I mean, it, we just get used to it. We know what's going to happen. We know, but I want you to listen to it with fresh ears, and maybe today you are here with fresh ears. This doesn't read like fantasy or fiction. This reads like a legal deposition. This reads like somebody who is trying to demonstrate and tell the story what happened, the kind of details they give. And, and here's what I think it tells us today, that we can live beyond the shadow of a doubt as well. Amen. That even as we're dwelling in the shadow lands, even as we're living through uncertain times economically uh, with health issues, even as we're living through uncertain times, maybe personally in a marriage that's broken, even as we're living through uncertain times with the loss of a dear friend, we can still live beyond the shadow of the doubt that is over us. Let me just tell you a few things that I think this passage encourages us to do as we seek to live beyond the shadow this Easter morning. First of all, I think it's important to examine the evidence. Just look what happens in this passage. Just think about this for a second. The specific witnesses that Luke is trying to describe that, took, that were a present when Jesus was crucified, as he was buried, and then as he was raised from the dead. The centurion, all the hit Jesus' acquaintances, the crowd beyond Jesus' acquaintances, the 11 disciples who heard the women's testimony. But even more specifically, he gives names. Joseph, a Jewish man, a good, righteous Jewish man who was looking for the kingdom of God. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and Peter are all specifically named in this passage. There are specific times that are mentioned in this passage. The sixth hour to the ninth hour. Luke wants you to know this is a very specific time. And by the way, if you're confused as to when it happened, do you remember when that strange thing in the temple took place in the temple, the veil in the temple was torn into? Yeah, it was on that day at the sixth hour to the ninth hour. A very specific time, the day of preparation. But it was also a specific place. There was a new tomb not far from the crucifixion site where nobody had ever been laid, no body had ever been placed there before. The women saw this specific place where Jesus' body was laid. So specific time, specific people, specific place, but also a specific warning. As the women come to the tomb and they're confused, thinking somebody has stolen the body, these two mysterious figures in garments that are blazing white say to them, hey, didn't Jesus tell you this was going to happen? Like there were things happening before this morning that you should have clued in on that you missed. There were specific warnings as well. 
So it's important for us this morning as you're living in the shadow of doubt to examine the evidence, the evidence that we have, not just in this account. Listen, this is just one ancient historic document that gives testimony of what we, what we know to be true about the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. You've got other eyewitnesses accounts. In fact, there are 27 ancient texts that are in our Bible that tell the story of the resurrection of Jesus. 27 ancient texts. And then beyond that, you've got evidence from other ancient Roman literature that says Jesus was a real person who lived a real life, who died a real death, and then something happened. Something happened that has caused the world to still, to this day, 2,000 years later, get up early on an Easter morning, come out into the cold and stand and hear this story over and over again. When you're living in the shadow of doubt, examine the evidence that is around you. Not just the evidence that we have in scripture, but the evidence of people whose lives have been changed forever. There are people standing around you today whose lives are different today because they've come to know the truth of the evidence that they've chosen to put their faith in, evidence that goes beyond the shadow of a doubt. But it's more than just that. Another thing you can do is to identify your assumptions and to question your doubts. Identify your assumptions and question your doubts. Look at the centurion in this story. He was a Roman citizen. He, he didn't care a thing about Jewish traditions. He didn't care a thing about the teachings of Jesus. He was just a guy doing his job, and his job was to oversee the execution of criminals. And listen to what he said. He looked up, and he saw this Jesus, somebody who had lived their whole life, staked their whole career on the fact that Rome is right and that might makes right. And here he is looking at the situation, and he says, Jesus is innocent. What caused the centurion to change his mind about Jesus? But it wasn't just the centurion. It was also the women. They had assumptions as well. The centurion assumed that Rome was right and Jesus was wrong. The women assumed that somebody must have moved, in the, moved the stone and stolen the body. And then these mysterious men in white show up and say, Why are you seeking the living among the dead? Listen to me. You cannot find life living in the shadow. You have to look beyond the shadow of a doubt to see where there's life. And these women were living in the shadow. Their assumption was dead people stay dead, tombs stay filled. Somebody must have stolen the body. The women came to the tomb with all their assumptions. And listen, they came to that place. They stayed in that place, even as they left still unsure their assumptions. But listen, they were willing to question their doubts. Luke's honesty about this, the women being the first eyewitnesses, is, is, a, is a remarkable evidence in the Gospel of Luke that there must be something true to this story. Women's testimony in the first century did not count in a court of law. And yet Luke tells that women were the first to report that Jesus' tomb was empty. Why would Luke have included that if it wasn't going to help him with his, with his audience? Because it was true. It's what happened. And so he wrote it down this way. I love what Tom Wright says about this. He said, if Luke had been making up a story a generation or more after the event, as people sometimes suggest, happened. Not only would he not have women going first to the tomb, women were not regarded as credible witnesses in the ancient world as the story itself bears out. He would have had the apostles believe the story immediately, ready to be models of faith and to lead the young church into God's future, but not so. It seems to them a silly fantasy, exactly the sort of thing they will have, they would have thought. That you'd expect from a few crazy women with grief and a lack of sleep. See, Luke wrote this story because exactly what happened. And, and so you see that they, they were questioning their doubts. But look, there's more than that. Just the disciples themselves. Jesus wasn't who they had hoped he was. They had thought he was going to be a Messiah. They thought he was going to deliver them politically out of this, out of this bondage that they were in under the Roman government. The, the crucifixion could have made Jesus a martyr. There have been other martyrs. Or it, it could have sealed his credibility as a prophet. But it was absolute evidence that he was not the Messiah. Because Messiahs don't take on the enemy and die. Messiahs take on the enemy and win. And so the, the apostles had all kinds of doubt about Jesus. Messiahs don't die at the hand of their oppressors. Jesus died at the hand of the Romans. Therefore, Jesus cannot be the Messiah. They all had assumptions. 
The centurion assumed Rome was right. The women assumed that the body was stolen. The disciples assumed that Jesus could not be the Messiah. Let me ask you, what are your assumptions about Jesus this morning? What do you assume? That's just a great story that we retell from year to year, that it's a, a myth, a fable, a fantasy. There are moral principles to be learned, but that's it. Is that what your assumption is? What are your assumptions about the resurrection? What is it that you are assuming? Because I think what we have to do is take a model from these people that are in the story, the centurion, the women, the disciples, and it's good for us to question our doubts, to identify our assumption and then to question our doubts. That Jesus was maybe just another good moral teacher and founder of another world religion? But that can't be true because good moral teachers don't say the kinds of things that Jesus said about himself. That maybe this whole story is irrelevant, just another legend or myth. But how do you know that? How do you know it's a legend or a myth? Have you ever questioned your assumptions? Have you ever questioned your doubts about it and put it to the test by looking at the real historic evidence that's there? Listen, you believe in something today. You believe in something. You may have confidence in the government. You may have confidence in science. You may have confidence in the medical community. You may have confidence in the people that you know and love. You may have confidence in the economy, in your work, in your bank account. You have confidence. You have belief in something. Have you identified what it is? Are you looking for the living among the dead? Because everything I just said is going to pass into the shadow of doubt at some time. Everything. Look at what happened this last year. Everything passes through the shadow of doubt. And the thing is not, do you believe something, but what do you believe and why do you believe it? And will it survive the shadow of doubt? So it, it's important as we think about this to examine the evidence, to identify our assumptions and to question our doubts, and then ultimately just to act in faith. It's how we live our lives. I mean, if, if 2020 and into 2021 has taught us anything, it's that sometimes you just have to act in faith regardless of the doubt that you have. You have to show up. You have to take the action because you can't be certain when you're living in the shadow of doubt. But when we have placed our faith in Jesus, when we placed our faith in the resurrected son, the shadow of doubt is dispelled and we can act in faith and in confidence. Look at these same people, the centurion, his tremendous act of faith declaring that Jesus was innocent. It was a huge risk for him to say this, that Joseph, this Jewish man among the Jewish leadership, he came out as a disciple of Jesus and asked Pilate for the body. It was a huge risk for his reputation. And Jesus was still just a, another failed Messiah at that point. And yet he acted in faith. The women went to tell the disciples, even though they knew that they would be ridiculed for what they were telling them. Peter, he still doubted, and yet what did he do? He got up and he ran to the tomb. Listen to what it says in Luke 24, 11 and 12. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. Peter did not believe them, but listen. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Let me just encourage you. If you this morning are here and you doubt that this story is true, you're in good company. Because Peter, Peter who Jesus said about on this rock, I'll build my church. Peter, who our Catholic brothers and sisters say is the, the, the foundation of the church and the very first leader of the church. Peter didn't believe it either. Neither did Matthew, neither did John. They, they, did, they didn't believe. They, they lived in this doubt. They lived in the shadow of doubt all day on Friday and Saturday and even on Sunday after they'd heard that he, the tomb was empty, they still lived in the shadow of doubt. You're in good company. I want to I want to challenge you this morning. If you are living in the shadow of doubt or maybe you're in communication, you're in conversation with somebody who's living in the shadow of doubt about Jesus, uh, there's a great book called The Case for Easter. In fact, we've got a few copies here today. And if you'd like a free copy today, you can have, we only have a few. So I'm just going to ask you, one of two categories, if you today are living in the shadow of doubt about the truth of this story, uh, we've got a book for you. Or if you are in serious conversations with somebody living in the shadow of doubt, we've got a book for you, but we've only got a few. So just take a few of those today as you leave. Also, if you will, just this week, maybe take some time just to question your assumptions. Because even the people who saw Jesus had questions. E e even with video evidence, you know, we, we watch videos all the time and we still doubt the things that we see. 
people still question, you know, did people really land on the moon or not, right? I mean, and there's video, I mean, we still question, even when we can see. So isn't it reasonable to think that we would still have questions even about Jesus today? Because we still live in the shadowlands. And some of you are living in the shadowlands today. You're living in the shadow of doubt. But the promise of Easter, the promise of the re resurrection is that the sun does rise and he dispels the shadow of death. Our friend who's been battling for his life, um, even as we were going through Monday, Thursday and Good Friday and then Silent Saturday has been waiting. But today, today our friend will emerge from the shadow of doubt. He'll emerge from the shadow of doubt, not just because we know he put his faith, not just in this story, but he put his faith in the, in the, the one who the story is about, pointing to Jesus. He'll, he'll rise from the shadow of doubt because he'll be with Jesus. He is with Jesus. But he'll also rise from the shadow of doubt as he donates life to other people today. As his organs are taken and given to others who are living in the shadow of doubt and they will find life even through his death. I can't think of a better Easter story than that. And knowing our friend Kyle the way I know him, it's exactly the story he'd want to tell. Because he lived beyond the shadow of a doubt because his faith and trust was in Jesus Christ. And what would he say to those of us still dwelling in the shadow? He would say, Jesus is alive. The sun will rise and the shadows will flee. Will you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you today that we can be assured that even as the sun is rising, even now, that you rose from the dead and the shadows of fear and doubt are dispelled. And Lord, I would pray that as, as we still live in those shadows, for some of us today, the shadow is so dark that we can't see our hand in front of us. Lord, for others, we're living with the hope of Easter and the hope of the sunrise. But God, I would pray for all of us that we would examine our assumptions, that we would not allow our doubts to drive us further into the shadows, but we would question our doubts, that we would act in faith, that we would examine the evidence, and that even though we have to remain in this shadow land a little longer, God, that we would not let the shadows define us. So, Father, today, for anybody who's here today living in the shadow of doubt, for anybody who's here today who doesn't have the hope that the sun does rise, I pray that today they would just examine the evidence. They would, they would question their doubts, and they would take one small step of faith, maybe just by reading a, a little book, maybe by talking to a friend who is a Jesus follower, maybe just by searching the evidence for themselves, but whatever it would take, God, may today be the day that the sun rises for them. And for those of us who have confidence that the sun has risen, Lord, may we live as people of the light, even as we go into the shadows. Lord, we thank you today for the hope that we have in Jesus. And we pray this in his powerful name.